because imagine the people who you could actually make interest doing this. So it's going to bring in not just people who are charitable, but it was going to bring in people who were trying to make some money. Um, and in those days, it was pre-credit crisis, and um, lots of banks were getting involved with lending to microfinance institutions. So the idea that Kiva was going to put a couple million into the system didn't seem that important. But um, as we started to talk to people, so we would talk to people who actually use the service. We would talk, talk to microfinance institutions that um, actually go find the beneficiaries. We would talk to experts in the area of microfinance. And what started to become clear to me was that there was this very unique one-to-one -one connection happening with Kiva that was going to have repercussions way beyond the amount of dollars that we're going to get into the country. And that we were watching lenders starting to take control of their own um, their own lending, and they were starting their own websites and blogs about how excited they were about lending. And there's actually a there's actually a really active website called Kiva Friends. It's not run by Kiva at all. So it's incredibly user driven. And as you know, like any time there's a business where it's user driven, um, it's way more successful. So think about eBay, right? Like eBay doesn't actually have to do any of the postings. They just build the tools. And you come and you post your own products you want to sell and eBay doesn't have to do any work. Well, that's a genius business, right? Anytime you are creating the content, it's, um, it, it's a lot more expensive to do because you need staff to do that. So Kiva's genius was in allowing the lenders to get excited about it. So here we were. They had lent um, maybe in total you know, several hundred thousand dollars. Their budget was $300,000 a year. And we were hearing from the field, this is not a good idea. And we decided um, when we looked at it, we really saw the momentum behind Kiva. So we backed Kiva. And over the course um, of our grant, they developed rapidly. I mean, they now lend $145 million a year. Um, and their annual budget just for operations is $15 million a year. So it, it was, it sort of expanded beyond our wildest dreams, but you could see that little kernel of it right in the beginning. And you almost, it was something that I couldn't quite put my finger on, but it was worth a bet. And that's what being a social entrepreneur investor is about, is seeing that little kernel and um, trying to get the barriers out of the entrepreneur's way so that they can, they can get there. Um, you guys all met David Risher, right, from World Reader. So he's one of our entrepreneurs. Um, David has some advantages coming into social entrepreneurship in that he is a technology executive. So he brings a lot of gravitas and understanding of management. Um, and when you look at our portfolio, if, if you have years of management, you, um, it's highly correlated with success. Um, so, and I sit on David's board. So part of my job with David is as many network connections as I can give him. He doesn't need help managing his staff. He's done that before. But for me, and he, and he doesn't need technology, he doesn't need me to introduce him to someone at Amazon. So what I'm doing is putting him in touch with as many growth funders as I can and helping him um, build out a strong board. So it's adjusting to each organization um, that we work with. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open a couple questions to see if people want to dive more into our model. Yeah? Is it typical of these types of organizations to have staff sit on the boards of uh, your grantees, essentially? And how do you do that with the capacity of your staff being smaller Yes, I should come to our next strategic planning meeting because we don't know how we're going to do it. Um, so I would say about half the organizations, uh, not quite half, sit on boards. So we sit on boards, New Schools Venture Fund, New Profit, mm, 
venture philanthropy partners in a way does. They bring a community member on. Um, it's a, it's a, it used to be somewhat controversial. Like it used to be like, isn't that a conflict of interest? But the fact of the matter is boards are filled with funders, right? I mean, that's the whole point, right? Like the opera board is filled with funders, right? Um, and what's actually delightful about having a professional on your board is that you know, my job is to be that person's board member. So at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he can call me. I'm at my desk, right? And I'm not at my other job. Um, and uh, my husband's in venture capital, and I hear him having these really great conversations on the phone about, you know, developing the – the CEO or getting the next financing round. And I was like, who are you talking to? And he's like, oh, I'm talking to the other dude from NEA or Kleiner or whatever. And I was like, that's what I need. I need more needs, right? Like you need, like, it would be great to have more strategic um, grantors on the board rather than fewer. Um, but it is a capacity issue. Um, I already sit, you know, on six boards. You know, you start to max out right? Because I do a lot of other things. Um, and But I have to tell you, what we've learned, especially at the early stage where you get great leverage on the board, you really like little decisions make a huge difference. Um, the when, when you're a funder and you're the biggest funder and the board is working really hard to try to make a good decision and then you hear about it and you come in and you're like, I don't like that decision. You're like that annoying, big, bad funder coming in. But when you were at the table of eight people and you have a conversation about whether or not to go into a new country, like you were one of eight voices and you're not hopefully too much stronger than anyone else, right? And it feels actually a lot less like a power difference than it does if you don't have a seat at the, at the board level. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, could you clarify if you find um, companies that seek to make a profit or if it's just uh, nonprofits? Yeah, currently just nonprofits. Um, that may change in the future, but for now, um, the world is get that distinction is becoming more and more um, murky, and we're talking about it. But you'll see in some of my examples that I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to um, different delivery models and it'll span both. Yeah. When you say extraordinary social entrepreneurs, do you mean that based on their ideas or based on their personal qualities also? Both. Okay. both. And what sort of personal qualities? Yeah, good Who question. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I think of them in two categories. So there's the classic... Um, leadership charisma side, which is about being a magnet. So a magnet for money, a magnet for volunteers, a magnet for great staff, right? Everybody is just can't wait to follow your idea. Um, you need that in any kind of entrepreneur, um, for profit or nonprofit. Um, and then the second half, um, which is actually hard to find both, would is a leader who's really a managerial leader. So somebody who can actually think in how are decisions going to get made and who are the right people to have in my board seats and which funders do I want to have sitting at the table and what systems do I need to put in place so that when we go from 10 people to 50 people, um, we can make decisions together. And th that's hard to be great at both those things, but we, we at least – like to see the that the person's able to grow pretty quickly into that role. We don't think it's really an option to replace the leader in the first three to five years. We just feel like, and it shouldn't, it usually isn't an option in a for-profit venture capital back deal either. It, it's just that the, the it's so leader-driven, it's such their personal story in the beginning, that we feel like, if they dropped out in the first three years, it, it wouldn't take off the way it needs to. So we really have to make sure our leaders have the capacity to do both. We'd rather have a great leader with a ho-hum idea than a great idea with a ho-hum leader.
yeah, yeah. Um, in that same vein, to what degree do you look towards demonstrated accomplishments <coughs> or previous projects to shape um, how much stress you place in the idea of the project? So, what, like, what do we look at the leader's resume or, right. yeah. Stories to tell you previous. Yeah, I mean, I think you want to see um, what they've accomplished. But you know, it's funny. Like, I feel like when I interview them, it's more about can they tell me their plan for this idea, right? Like, does it make sense when they're telling me how they're thinking about, you know, selling their product or raising money for it? Um, does it make sense when they're talking about? how they see the next three to five years playing out. And it's like their experience feeds into that. But if they told me they were like president of their class, I don't know, it doesn't, doesn't make as much difference to me. We have lots of entrepreneurs who are 22 years old. So like the correlation with managerial experience and success is you know, something I struggle with. But so we have to think about how do we put supports in place for the 22 year olds. I mean, one thing 22 year olds are not that great at, let me tell you, is like prioritization. Right? So, and I think it's just like time. I don't know what it is, but like sometimes, you, um, like a 40-year-old doesn't have to be told twice that they need to call their lead fundraiser back before they answer the email from the lady down the street, right? But sometimes 22-year-olds actually, like, it's amazing. Like, I actually have to say, I can't believe your lead funder just called me and said you haven't called her back for two weeks. Right? So there are just some things that like time and being in a work environment for a couple of years is like lets you sort of like ease into your professional self. And so how do we pair up young entrepreneurs and more um, mature entrepreneurs? And then the young entrepreneurs are the ones who are pushing the more mature ones to think out of the box and use technology more effectively and, you know, Stop worrying about the rules and be more transparent and all the things that, like, you know, people my age are not as good at. So, yeah. Uh, so in the for-profit world, there's an easy criteria, which is not, like, correct or anything to define success as money, right? Revenue. How do you do the same thing in the non-profit world? How do, what criteria, what structures of thought do you use to sort of define what's a good idea, what's an awesome idea? Yeah. Um... So, so I think some of that's a myth in, in the early years. So let me just propose that. I don't know if that's, I don't know if everyone would agree with me. But if you're funding a for-profit and your end goal is profit, right? And if you want it to be a blockbuster, then it's, you need huge revenue to get the huge profits, right? So it's revenue, but not quite. It's profit. Um, in the early years, there's no revenue and there's no profit. So you have to have a whole bunch of indicators that you're moving in the right direction, right? A whole bunch of indicators that people are interested in your product, that you're able to attract the right funders, that in people are joining your staff who are really bright and smart, and that you're able to show that you can build the product in an efficient, effective way, um, that people are going to like it. So as an early stage investor in that, you have to be able to read all those signals. And those are really similar to the signals I have to read. In addition to that, um, uh, there are social impact goals, which um, are not always easy to measure, but they're very clear. Um, so let's say you you're an entrepreneur and you've decided that you want um, to reduce the number of 18 to 20 year olds in um, 22 year olds in jail. And you've done a lot of research and you've worked in the system and you've decided that where it all starts is in middle school when kids um, lose the interest in school and that's when they start to decide to drop out. They drop out in ninth and 10th grade, but that's when they decide. Right, so you start a middle school apprenticeship program to link what you do in school to something cool in the outside world um, that, you, that you're interested in. By the way, this is a program in San Francisco called Spark. And, but in the early years, how are you going to know that your program's working, right? You've got a bunch of middle schoolers. How are you going 
to figure out whether or not they avoid jail when they're 18 and 19. So you have to have, so the trick of early stage funding is figuring out what are the leading indicators. They lead you to know that you're going to get there. So what are you going to measure today? And then you're going to measure, you know, the prison stuff later. So you might measure attendance. You might do a survey of the kids and ask, how do you like school, and is it better now than it was, and what did you learn at your internship, right? And you're fixing your model and making it better so that, um, and then you're linking it with research, right? Like research shows that kids stay out of jail if they're engaged in school in seventh grade, right? And you use that link to build your middle school program. Does that help? Yeah, it's not clear. And in our portfolio, we're funding dramatically different things. So one challenge that we have is, how do I compare what Kiva does to what Room to Read does or what Vision Spring does? Like it's, you know, they do totally different things. Um, all right, cool. One thing I thought about doing with you guys, because I had heard there was some interest in understanding um, social enterprise models and different um, what are some examples? So, um, oh, just, I guess I skipped over this pretty, I hate, don't worry about this slide, it's too full, it's not supposed to be a screen slide, but we talked about how important leadership is, we talked about, is it actually, is the model actually having real impact on the problem that it is um, working towards? And, and then this middle one is this scalable model, and we, we have a strong bias towards um, scale for two reasons. One, scale meaning getting bigger. So one is because these are big, big, big problems, and you need to solve them in a big, big way. Um, and number two, because these are really cool leaders with really cool models, and they should affect the way other people do their work. Other people should be doing a better job running their organizations and, um, and maybe um, investing government dollars or building for-profits. And you can't influence all of that if you're a teeny little organization. You have to get big and bold enough, right? Like you have to be Kiva before um, things like Watsi springs up and other, you know, interest interesting entrepreneurs come out of the woodwork. So, all right. So I want to walk you through something I've been playing with a little bit that I'm wondering if um, it'll end up being useful for you. So this is a pictorial of a traditional charitable model where philanthropic or government dollars are paid to a social enterprise, whether that be for profit or nonprofit, and they provide a product or service for beneficiaries, right? It sounds pretty basic, right? So uh, as an example, philanthropists give money to Room to Read. Room to Read provides schools, libraries, and girls scholarships to school children in developing worlds. And then they judge their success over here um, by, uh, by literacy rates and school attendance. Um, who can tell me some pros uh, and cons about this model? Not, not room to read, but the charitable model. <coughs> yeah. Well, the philanthropists are inevitably making a loss. It's just the generosity. So Sorry? They, the philanthropists don't get anything back, or they're, they're making a loss whenever they donate. So that's a con yep. for this yeah. disincentive. Yeah. There's not necessarily like accountability as far as checking in on like metrics for how you're doing, like how are you using our money effectively, what are you doing with it. Let's say there is. Let's say they have to show results. The, in the middle, Room to Read has to show the philanthropist their results. Yeah. Room to Read is totally dependent on the philanthropist. Yeah. So if that foundation decides to support someone else, yeah. So, seems 
pretty good up front, right? There's a lot of philanthropic dollars up in the front, but if you're trying to grow this thing and go forever, um, you know, the philanthropist can, can shut off the spigot. Um, what's great about this model? Yeah. When it comes to accountability, you're not relying on someone else's needs. It's the needs of your, <coughs> it's the needs of your kind of organization and the philanthropists believe in your, in what you believe in. Yeah. So you're able to have, like, you hold yourself accountable from that to that. And they make sure that that accountability is maintained. So you can, like, create your own accountability structure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it costs less to ask philanthropists for money than to ask school children what they need. So it, this is a supply-driven framework, and if yeah. it was more demand-driven, as in you were getting feedback up front from school children before providing them a product or service, this just costs a lot more. Okay. Because you're completely mission-driven, and you don't really have to always think about how can I make sure that I make money back here Yeah. Um, with every step. Yeah, you have to pay anyone back. Right. right? Money keeps going that direction. And uh, <coughs> what about the school children? If they have to pay you, what kind of children can you serve? Not the poorest of the poor, right? Necessarily. You could argue that. There are some for profit schools in the slums of Nairobi that are doing pretty well for a But just as a theory. Okay. I'm calling this social enterprise non direct, but don't quote me on that. This I literally did this afternoon. Okay. So. This idea is, once again, on the left, uh, an organization or a government pays a social enterprise through a contract for a product or service, and that social enterprise provides the product or service to beneficiaries. So let me give you an example, because it seems a little obscure. OK. Has anyone heard of Rev Foods? Yeah, good. They, they make healthy um, meals for school kids in low-income schools. The, the government pays for the meals through the school budget. They pay Rev Foods, and Rev, Rev Foods provides a service. So that's the contract, but the school meals go to children. All right, so pros and cons of this model. Yeah? Well, a pro is that you get more consistent funding according to the contract yeah. you have. Yeah, because we decided that kids, especially low-income kids, are going to get fed. They're going to get fed at least one meal. Now we say two. So Rev Foods can count on that every single year. Yeah. Maybe one of the cons is that um, Revolution Foods is tied into what the government wants and maybe not necessarily can't focus as much on their mission. Okay, so if their mission were healthy food and they couldn't achieve that within the per person amount, that would be a problem, right? So Red Foods, they're, the genius of Red Foods is that they've made it work within the allotted amount. You're absolutely right. Otherwise, they'd probably have to be a pure charity. Yeah? I think also, too, um, in the nonprofit sector, because it's nonprofit, uh, the optics of it, generally people tend to not think of it as professional services, just like charitable services. Yeah. And I think being paid for your services professionalizes it. Yeah. And I think it takes you to a whole other level of capacity, a whole other level of, visit, of, of how people see your work yep. as being professional services yeah. as opposed to charitable. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. You also do that right? have no incentive to sort of Pack more meals within the budget than they have if they're giving out to a certain number of kids. Does that make sense? That to make their system more efficient, having less money per meal that they provide the same quality of meal because they scale the scale up. So you're saying it would behoove Rev Foods to cut costs? Well, we don't necessarily have that. Um, they're not necessarily incentivized to do so given that they have a certain budget allocated for a certain number of kids. I mean, obviously... Right, that, uh, yes. If, if they are paid per child, which they probably are, you're right. If they're paid on en masse for the children and they can... They're for profit, so presumably 
they're delivering their food for less than the government paid them to deliver that food. So if they can get that lower, um, the, the trick is they still have to produce. Hopefully they're achieving their mission, right? So there's one of the cons, right? There's this driver for them to keep lowering costs because they have investors who want to make profit. Um, what else is wrong with this loop? Like, who's not in the loop? Who's over here? Parents. <laughs> and the children are still out of the loop, right? I mean, that's that's a lot of our work, but it, it, this but you'll see why I say that. Okay. Okay. So here is a direct social enterprise where you're selling a product or service directly to a beneficiary, right? And the, the great thing about this is you can imagine, well, I don't, you can tell me why it's great. All right. So has anyone heard of Vision Spring? Vision Spring's one of our grantees. It's a nonprofit. It's a um, social enterprise. And the, um, what they, the problem they're solving is, um, in the developing world, uh, there is not an easy way to access reading glasses. Um, like there is, like you can go to the drugstore here and buy reading glasses. They're easier to prescribe to yourself. Um, yet 99% of the literate world and a large percentage of the non-literate world develops presbyopia or the, they lose the ability to see up close. And so if you're a weaver, a metal worker, a rabbi, a teacher, whatever your profession is, you can no longer do it starting at about age 40, right? And you can imagine you've got 10 kids and you're taking care of your parents and you can no longer weave. Like problem, right? So Jordan Castello said, I can solve that problem. And he, what he did was he um, hired all these female social entre lady entrepreneurs to go into their villages and sell reading glasses. And the ladies made money, and the villagers bought the glasses, and everybody made a profit up the chain. So people got the reading glasses they needed. And by the way, they didn't buy the cheapest ones. They liked the more stylish ones and were willing to pay up for them. So it was really interesting um, market study. And they get feedback. What kind of glasses do they like? How do they like them delivered? And what Jordan decided at some point was it wasn't going fast enough with the ladies going door to door. So he set up kiosks where, like you'd see in a Walgreens, he has those in marketplaces. Then he's going even more aggressive. He's setting up whole stores like you'd go into an optometry store, like a lens crafter. Now he's opening those, right? Bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but it's all under a nonprofit, right? So there's lots of interesting revenue stuff that happens in all sorts of legal constructs. So can anyone think of another model like this that has this direct feedback loop? And if not, tell, tell me pros and cons of this. We sort of went through some of them. Yeah. World Reader would be here. Because the kids aren't buying the, the In some cases, the schools are buying them. In other cases, a philanthropist is buying them. So it's even further back in the cycle. Um, you could imagine a case where they could sell e-reader to a family, maybe. But currently, they're not doing that. Yeah. Synergy is one of those, I think. Synergy? Synergy. Synergy is one. Um, also one of my grantees. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so tell, tell everybody why. Um, because what they do is install bathrooms in hard-to-reach slums, places where sanitation is an issue, and then charge for a usage, employ an entrepreneur who takes care of them, and then with the waste, transform that into fertilizer and sell those to farmers. And with the profits, sort of fund the whole system. It's amazing. Is that cool? It's so cool. Right? But it's, I think one of the most unique things about it is it's franchising. I mean, they franchise right. their toilets. So 
though it's an entrepreneur who buys the toilet, and then they earn their money from u the usage fees. Right. Yeah. And then they and the services that, uh, and the monies that they pay for san pay Sanergy, they um, collect the they collect the waste, so they don't have to deal with any of all you know all the hygiene right. stuff around composting toilets, which right. is amazing. Yeah, they're awesome. No. So let's use Sanergy as an example. So if the goal is just to make that a sustainable model, you could keep selling franchises and whoever wanted to own a franchise could own a franchise, right? But at Sanergy, they have an overarching social impact mission, which is health. And in order to get the health benefits of getting waste off the ground in a high um, density um, residential area, you need to get 75% of people disposing of their waste properly. And so they're using a series of being very strategic about which franchise owners they allow so that they have it spread out. So that because um, women and children won't walk and shouldn't walk more than a certain distance at night to use a bathroom, right? So you need your toilets to be in certain locations, number one. Number two, they're using a system where they use philanthropic dollars to um, put toilets in schools. So um, you, you have a school, and what's great is it's not the kids don't pay each time. The kids use it all day long. So it really encourages um, the health benefits, number one. Number two, it has significantly raised the uh, attendance of girls. You imagine being a girl. I'm going to say this, and I think it's being filmed. A girl with your period, age 13, and you don't have a bathroom, right? So, um, so, so now girls are getting to school twice as much as they were before. Um, and so you can do certain things in the model that aren't profit maximizing, but get to your health benefit. Um, and that's what's neat about social enterprise. Uh, all right, and I got one more for you. Okay, so this is similar. The social enterprise sells a product or service to a buyer. Buyer pays the social enterprise. But the social good is over here. Um, can anyone think of an example? Uh, maybe it's too obscure. Maybe carbon lighthouse can be kind of an example. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna. So Tesla's my example. Um, you know, the buyer gets benefits. Buyer feels good. Buyer looks good, right? Um, but the cleaner environment is the social impact, um, primary social impact, um, and the buyers sometimes paying for the product because of that. But it is. Um, I just wanted to make to distinguish it because the social good isn't in that they they themselves are healthier. It's that the whole environment is healthier. Um, any questions on these? Yeah. Would companies that are for profit but like donate a portion of their profit to some other cause fall under this category? <coughs> no. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, you know, like I think they're cool. Like good for you, but it, I wouldn't call it a social enterprise because it isn't the business that you're doing. Even at Tom's, right? Like the business they're doing is not causing social good. They're in the shoe business, and then they donate. I don't know some other shoes, but um, so it's. It, I think it's awesome, but I don't think it's. I would. I wouldn't call it social entrepreneurship. Yeah. I think for a lasting change, you need something to be sustainable without being the presence of the organization anymore. And I'm wondering if you think about ways or if you evaluate uh, entrepreneurs or the organizations based on their ability to completely uh, create self-sustenance in a region. And like, is there a model for that? Like, in all of these examples, you know, you're bringing glasses in from the outside, you're bringing toilets in from the outside. It's, it's money from another region or another group of people. Well, the to toilets are made in Kenya, right? The whole business is in Kenya. Um, but the goal of that is not that Sanergy is going to make every single toilet in Africa, right? The goal is definitely to prove that this works and then get other entrepreneurs to pop up and copy them. So would the goal be to have those other entrepreneurs local, or does it matter? <coughs> Um, they, I think they have to be local. I mean, all the staff, they have 120 staff and 80 of them are local. Um, yeah, I mean, 
But like if the Norwegian Development Corp came in and funded a Sanergy lookalike in Malawi, like, yeah, that's cool. Like just more of it. Eventually what happens is if your financial model works, I mean, that's, that's one of the promises of for-profit social enterprise. If you can show that it makes money, people will copy. It's, it's, un, it's unproven, but that's one of, one of the hopes. Yeah? Um, where are we on time? We have, we have a half an hour, right? So I can go into more stuff, but I'm also open to totally um, general conversations about anything. Yeah. Talk about the coolest social enterprises that you laid eyes on and the ones that were really cool but sort of felt like they weren't thought out enough. Um, yeah. Uh, so the coolest, uh, the coolest enterprise, I think I funded the coolest ones. Um, but there are some that I'm not, I haven't been able to fund because they're for profits. We haven't done for profits yet. So there are a couple. I mean, Red Foods I had to say no to, which was a little sad. Um, yeah, I think that they're, um, I think one of the mistakes entrepreneurs sometimes make is that they try to do too many things at the same time. And so um, I think sometimes there's really talented entrepreneur and like if they just focused on one of the four things that they're trying to do, um, then it would be much more successful. You can expand later, but you really have to focus in the early years. Yeah. Um, what are some things that you are glad you did in college that helped you get to the point where you are now? I was so clueless in college. I'm so amazed by some of the 20-somethings that I meet who have so much direction. I didn't really figure out what I wanted to do till I was 30. Um, so uh, I was a true liberal arts major in college and really sunk very deeply into being an academic. Um, and I would not give that up for anything. Um, I sometimes wander around the Stanford campus and see all the opportunities, and I think, oh my God, so amazing. You're over at the D school, and then you're you know, at this competition, and you're seeing the speaker, and it is. It's amazing. Um, and I would do more of that if I could go back, but I wouldn't give up having those four years where I could just deeply... Um, explore um, sort of the, the classics and also uh, my interpretation of literature and the sciences and just for the sake of that. I think it made me a smarter person and you, you almost never get it again. So I would say take an art course, take a music appreciation course. I sound like my parents, that's what they told me to do. And, oh, and my father made me take an econ course. He's an economist, so. I ended up at business school, so I guess it was all right. But, um, yeah, you don't get, you don't get, like, and I just read this article, right, about Stanford and how the liberal arts are not being taken advantage of. Like, definitely, definitely, like, go to a poetry class. It's awesome. You'll never get that again. So that's what I would say was the smartest thing you did during business school to help you get where you are today? Oh, I met my husband. <laughs> <laughs> smartest decision I made. Um, I feel very lucky having gotten into Stanford. It changed my life completely, um, not just because of Josh, but, um, uh, you know, for me, I was... Um, from the East Coast, I uh, worked in a big ad agency, which is bizarre given what I do now. I told you I was lost, right? So, um, and everyone around me was always telling me, oh, you just have to wait for that one next level, 
right? Like you, you go from, and if any of you go into banking or management consulting or anything in a big service oriented, you learn so much, but it is very much geared towards keeping you like in there, right? So it's always like, just stay a little bit longer, follow the rules, do it a little bit more like this. And I think when I came to Stanford, it was this idea and California was you, you can do anything you want to do. You have an idea, try it, start it. And if it fails, try something else. Um, and that, that I never, I never moved back because that I couldn't get enough of that. And um, I, I guess I should have known then that I was going to work with entrepreneurs. But um, that was probably just embracing that in business school and um, really finding like-minded people. I also did my Master of Education at the same time and finding those folks who were really trying to make the world better using their business degree. Um, and there are a lot of them at Stanford Business School. It's a great place to be um, into social impact. Um, I think those were good decisions. Yeah. I have a question about the space in general um, for social, for helping to support and launch social entrepreneurs. I found that I, I've kind of been in the field for seven years or so, and I'm finding the same kind of organizations that are being funded. Okay. So you're seeing Echoing Green Fellows, and the Draper Richard Kaplan portfolio, Ashoka helped launch some of them. Mm -hmm. um, and I question, you know, there's so many promising projects out there. I mean, Globally, and a lot of entrepreneurs don't have access to these types of institutions. Maybe they're not as sophisticated. Maybe they don't have the networks. You know. So, do you think that organizations like Draper Richards Capital and others are doing the homework and the due diligence to find the most the most <coughs> promising ideas out there? Because that takes a lot of legwork and it takes a lot of work to be on the ground. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just an observation that I've been making over the course of the past seven years or so where I'm seeing a lot of people rotating in and out of these, even competitions that are winning the same awards. Yeah. You know, they're being uh, profiled in conferences, and I'm thinking there's so many <coughs> wonderful, amazing projects yeah. that are under the radar. How do we find those people, and how do we support them? I think as a funder, you need to be very careful, especially if you're funding a any issue area, right? You need to you need to know what you're good at, and you need to know your mission. And um, I think there are um, there are funders for whom that is a primary part of what they want to achieve in the world, right? And they need to design funding mechanism and programs to um, to achieve that. I think about like. Global Green Grants or um, Global Fund for Children or, you know, where, where their goal is literally to find the entrepreneurs in the middle of nowhere and give them some money and assistance. But if you're going to, if you're, if you're going to do the like really, really deep high engagement work we do, then we need to do that really, really well. But I don't disagree with you. I mean, it is the same, you know, you get a little resume of all your social entrepreneur wins and awards. Um, and I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, there's, there's a group of funders called the Big Bang Network, which is like us, Weekly, Jasmine, Milago, Pershing Square, you know. And I was really reluctant when it was put together because I was like, God, how much more group think do we need, yeah. you know? Um, but, um, on the other hand, um, what I think the group has come to be is that there are pockets of money out there for social entrepreneurship without staffing to do the due diligence and the support. And we do that. And so part of our role in that group is to do the work and then they put the, they put a lot more money in on top of ours and that's great for our entrepreneurs. So yeah, we're all funding the same thing, but like I'm working hard for Synergy to get more money, right? Because I think they're great and I've been working really hard for them to be great and to use the money really responsibly. So if eight new funders come in, I'm thrilled. So that's the other side of it, right? Is that my one of my roles in the world 
is for money to go from pro- projects that sort of suck to like awesome projects. And if I can be that stamp of approval on something, um, that's one of our goals. Yeah. So, kind of, this has two parts. A question with two parts. First part is all these organizations you fund, they're doing good every single day. So, in terms of a traditional startup, it might fail when it goes bankrupt. So, how do you, when do you think one of your investments fails, or what will be an indicator of it failing? Mm-hmm. And the second part is kind of the opposite side. You fund these organizations with a dream, with the ideal position they would reach. So, it, of course, it depends based on the organization, but so far, did you have any of the, your organizations reaching to that moment and saying, like you saying, yes, I did it, like I funded the right person, and now they're changing the world, or you think they're still on the path? I mean, is there anything in our portfolio where I feel like they're, they're done? Or like, what will be a done moment for one of them? <laughs> like, what's your dream done moment? Well, you know what's interesting is the dream done moment changes. So I think about, like, Taproot Foundation, which um, really turned pro bono work on its head. So it basically says, instead of, you know, you're a lawyer and you go into a nonprofit you care about and you say, I want to volunteer and you're stuffing envelopes, Right. So what they say is, no, 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 let's be very organized about our pro bono service so that you're actually doing what you're really good at and you do it on a team of other people in an appropriate way and you deliver a real service or product to a nonprofit and you treat them like a paying client, okay? So Aaron Hurst and his team are building this thing and they're doing more and more projects and, like, it just occurs to him one day, I can never do enough. So then he says, it's not about... Okay, I've gotten big enough that now I have some leverage, but it's about getting the world to understand pro bono um, work, to allocate time of all their employees to do the work, and um, for us to help them with the structures and the timelines and the feedback loops that we've gotten really good at. So he's gone from saying it's not, it's, it was direct service, now it's about advocacy. Um, and so the end game really changes. Um, there's, there's an organization in our portfolio called Refuge Point, and what they do is they streamline the relo- relocation of um, asylees around the world. Um, so there are hundreds of thousands of spots left vacant each year um, for asylees to be relocated, um, partially because the system is um, sort of slow and antiquated. And so... <laughs> What he did, instead of being combative, the organization worked with UNHCR to streamline their process and um, and even in the end to give them credit for it. And now UNHCR, which is the only body that has the ability to do it, is now processing people much faster and the system's moving faster. So, like, he, it's almost a victory just right there, right? He's got a lot more work to do, but... What we love about that example is that he wasn't doing the work directly, but he was working with a government agency who has all the power and the money to do it and getting them to be more effective. So we're looking at impact differently. Um, You asked about failure. Um, We have had six organizations in our portfolio completely fail out of 56. uh, and I think in the nonprofit sector, um, the incentive to close the doors are, is lower than, than it is in the for-profit sector. Because in the for-profit sector, if you're not making money and you keep losing money, um, that's a pretty high incentive to close your doors. But if you can just eke out a couple more grants, you can keep that sucker going for a pretty long time in the nonprofit sector. So there's probably um, less... Um, or there are probably organizations that should go out of business that are not out of business. Not in our portfolio. I, I think our leaders are strong enough. But there certainly are some that aren't growing rapidly. They're just, they're just doing good work. Yeah. So how did that six 
how did the ones <coughs> fail fail? Um, in a couple cases, complete uh, failure to raise money. Um, and we'd analyzed why that is in different cases. Um, we believe in one case we funded an organization where the founder was not the leader, right? So the founder was the chairman of the board and the leader was a hired person. And we really um, struggled with that decision and we made it and it ends up like, if you're not the one doing it full time all day, you're, you, you don't have that pressure to, um, um, it's not your primary responsibility to raise the money. And uh, so we're pretty adamant that the founder is the CEO. Um, in other cases, um, uh, 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 these, are pre these are pretty specific and detailed, but like a complete change of strategy um, and the new strategy was untenable and we pulled our grant. Um, just sort of underestimated the ability of the leader to keep the board pulled together. But the, it was a fascinating, uh, it was a fascinating organization because the board was made up of two different tribes of Sudanese refugees. And in the end, they were using the board as a, um, as a two soapboxes to sort of air concerns to each other and they weren't able to agree on a strategy. So board composition is important. Yeah. So when a social enterprise fails, what do you find social entrepreneurs doing after that? We don't get to talk to a lot of those. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, I mean like are they starting another one? I, I don't know if I, I'd have to like think of a, a bunch of examples and then before I sort of come to a conclusion, but. There's no one thing that's going to be with some of our students being able to help you out if you have uh, situations where expanding your bandwidth or really maybe doing due diligence or helping you the foundation in some way. Um, you have a room full of very, tal very talented folks who might want to throw themselves into research or any other internships that you guys might offer. So, yeah, uh, may maybe. Um, maybe I'd have to, I'd have to think about that. Um, I think, uh, I think one of the best things people um, do for us is refer interesting ideas to us. Um, and uh, any idea, you know, any organization is fine. It doesn't, um, sometimes people are reluctant to send stuff because they're like, oh, I'm not sure if it's just right, but we're pretty good at sifting through stuff. So I think that's one of the, the best things. Yeah. Um. Um, I, my name's Gemma. I uh, run a program called the Global Women's Water Initiative, and we train women how to build water and sanitation technologies in East Africa. And I feel like one of the things that has succeeded in our program is the support system that we build around, around the women who are just starting to build their entrepreneur programs, their mm -hmm. water entrepreneur programs. And I think I see that that's 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 basically the core of the fellowship or, or, or the, you know, how you select your people. You're, you're building a support team around them. Do you find that most of the people that you are funding have that mechanism? Because, you know, technology is one thing and, um, you know, implementation strategy is another. But, but in terms of building support around the people who are actually <coughs> implementing, that's one of the pieces I feel like is missing a lot in some of the mm -hmm. social entrepreneur programs. And I feel like that's what you guys do. I wonder if that's one of your criteria for how you select the people that you fund. So do you mean, are they pretty good about putting together their own support network? Support network around the people that are, are, are being built up. So for example, for us, we have, uh, we have women that we train who become uh, technicians and they build simple technology <coughs> for communities, they sell water related products, mm -hmm. so they're, they're generating income. But the, the way, because this is the first time they're ever doing it, we actually have a team that is surrounding them 
constantly meeting with them, constantly building their entrepreneurial, you know, capacity, constantly uh, answering questions around, you know, technical uh, things right. like that. Right. So, and and that's what I feel like you're doing. You know, you're you're sort of filling the gaps in where with these, our entrepreneurship. Yes. Yeah. With your, yeah. The, the way you support your your uh, your actual entrepreneur. So I wonder if those organizations that you fund have that similar sort of model when they have beneficiaries actually running yes. businesses. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, Yes, I think I think the answer is yes. I think in any situation where you're depending on another person or organization to deliver your product, um, you have to have the right accelerator break um, ratio and training and support, and then getting out of the way. And generally, um, they always have to add more training and support than they thought they were going to need. Um, and that has, that includes um, um, folks in the field, but it also includes like some of our core programs, like Food Core or Global Health Core, where you're sending um, an American into country or someone from another country into the United States. They do much better if they're paired, um, or and then they're in a cohort, and they do much better if they're given, you know more support in those early years. And if you look at like the Kiva Fellows Program, it's it's gotten, um, the training program has gotten better around it than it was in the beginning. Still pretty light training. I think a lot of organizations are starting to take, because we do a fellowship program mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's all about, you know, uh, transition, uh, really building a support, you know, just that support um, that could be ongoing, that could be, something that starts out as a, a year-long thing, but all of a sudden you have your champion who yeah. can then start really, yeah. you know, uh, continuing to talk about their experience and, you know, uh, building the visibility around your organization. That's right. That's right. Sharing best practices is a really important part of, of training and, um, and, and allowing, when you have agents in the field, allowing them to experiment and then bubble up the new ideas um, so that everybody can share it. Um, and because uh, you, you can't have it all coming from headquarters down because they're not in the field. They don't know really what's working and what's not working as well. Yeah. Gina, are you, um, are you made mainly uh, U.S. nonprofits? Yeah, so all, yeah, so they're all, they're all based in the U.S. Um, because of the way we work on the boards, but more than half do their work overseas. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, in, in, in hunting the, the like entrepreneurs, right? Are you looking at more of this scalability, or, or do you fund areas in, for instance, healthcare, education, where scaling is, if you really do a quality job, scaling is very difficult. Yeah. So how do you kind of look at these kind of issues? Yeah, I think that um, we bend the definition of scale a little bit depending on the issue area, but we still have turned a lot of things down that cannot scale. Like, we wouldn't fund an individual school, for instance, even if it had a really cool way of doing things, um, unless we thought there was a clear plan to taking that philosophy or that program to many schools, for instance. Yeah, so we've had to turn things down that could never get out of a small local area. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the beginning of the presentation, you said that you see social entrepreneurship as a uh, So uh, if that's the case, do you see it evolving into something else? Do you see it, Do you see the idea of making business for social change that it's going to just die out? Or where do you see things, like how do you see the future, both near and far? Yeah, I just don't know if it's going to be a label, right? I, I just think people are going to do their work um, in, a, in a more innovative, creative way. They're going to look for solutions um, that have revenue. They're going to look for solutions that um, use partners in different ways. All these things that we associate now with social entrepreneurship, I'm hoping will be um, just natural in the whole field. Um, and I also hope this distinction between venture philanthropy and philanthropy will also um, 
sort of disappear and that traditional philanthropists will use some of our techniques and we can use some of their techniques and it um, everybody will will do a better job um, so I, I don't think the ideas are a fad but I, I think the label itself like sometimes I think someone says oh I'm going to teach a course on social entrepreneurship and I I don't know what that means right it could it, like what do you mean what are you um, because it could it's a definition that can almost mean anything these days um, yeah. Yeah. You said you uh, mentioned that after you wanted companies, you uh, you were on their board to see how things are running. So could you uh, like is it would it a case arises when you think that a firm is going in the direction you didn't initially see it going? All the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, one one of the advantages of being tied very closely with your entrepreneur is that when they change direction, it's not a surprise. Um, uh, you know, and generally, um, they're changing direction for the, for the better. Uh, we want them to listen to the marketplace and experiment and quickly change when something's not working. Um, and they need to even change whatever metric they're using sometimes um, based on, on what they're learning. Um, so yeah, that's, that's hopefully what they are doing. Yeah, but it's remarkable how, how tightly they do stick to their original plan. Um, it's, it's actually remarkable because um, they all have a, have a three-year plan with us. Um, but we encourage them to change that along the way. If needed. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just like a. So, if suppose they go in a direction you don't want them going, yeah. Would you explicitly say that we we would there be like what? How what would you? Would you give them feedback on what they're doing, or like just say we're not your funding if you don't kind of? Yeah, I think it depends on on what that means. So, if they're going in a direction that we think is a poor use of charitable dollars, we actually have an obligation with the IRS to stop the funding. Um. If they're like if they were funding education and they decide they want to fund small businesses, we also have a really good argument for removing the money. I don't know. We've never had the. I mean, we had this one case where um, the entrepreneur, after three months, um, changed direction um, to a really weak plan. But there were other major problems um, internally brewing um, that put him in breach of contract. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think about founders that are based in the U.S. Uh, yeah. of organizations who operate abroad? Um, I've seen it work really well. Um, I see an increasing trend to the founders moving to country for at least two to three years. Uh, but there's a, a difficult part of that, too. Um, when you live in country, you're on top of the program. You're really seeing what's going on, and you're building it, and you're building the correct local context, but it's really hard to fundraise and it's really hard to build your board and it's hard to find, to hire and, and, and develop talent. So there, I've, I've seen both models a lot and I've, um, like Room to Read is headquartered here, but they have country managers who are from that country um, making their own goals for that country and, and running that country and I think that model uh, works really well, and then headquarters can be filled with people who are good at fundraising and M and E, and you know that measurement and evaluation. Um, but like Synergy, the three founders live in Kenya, uh, and they're on planes a lot, and they have to be really organized when they come to the states about having all their meetings lined up. And the master, did you guys know One Acre Fund? Um, so it's one of ours. And Andrew Yoon has taught us a lot about how to do that successfully and really when he comes in for two weeks like having you know a three city trip it's always the same three cities he just decided that and um, uh, you have to get your head up out of the work it's really hard and then to get on email and on the phone and just start pestering people for who do you know and I gotta have meetings and it's a lot of fundraising it's a lot of fundraising if you guys are thinking about being social entrepreneurs 
and really getting those meetings set up so that when you come to town, you are making the most of your time. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say uh, I'm a student. I come up with, or, or whomever, and I come up with a social entrepreneurial idea. What do you suggest are the most important things I should think about uh, from sort of Molda, like really Molda the idea to actually applying for foundations, grants, funding, what have you? Um, I think you should really understand <coughs> the landscape. Like, I think you should really understand if the solution that you've come up with it, as actually needed, and you should know every other person affecting that problem that's, like, remotely related to what you've come up with. Um, it's the first thing I'm going to ask you. So who else is doing this? And if you say, I don't know, <laughs> I just have to say, why are you wasting your time on something you don't know if something already exists? Um, so I would say that, right? That shouldn't, that not only, like, so if nothing exists, interesting, right? Or, oopsie, maybe that's scary, because maybe because nobody can solve the problem yet. And number two, if something exists, it doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you should be learning everything you can from the mistakes they've made and the successes they've had so that your product is way better. Um, and so it's sort of to save you time and I'm an energy. Yeah. Uh, do you see any evolution on that uh, end? That because, for example, I'm comparing with the traditional business. You just go and take a loan from a bank, and then if you fail, it's so clear. And when you get the money, uh, whereas here it's so manual that you talk to people, you convince them, there's so many different metrics. Do you see any evolution there that? would make it more streamlined or more commoditized in that space? Well, I, I don't, you might be a for-profit entrepreneur, but I haven't heard for-profit entrepreneurs say it's simple to walk down to the bank and get a loan, right? So I think, I think people often complain about how the philanthropic sector is broken, right? That it's not transparent how the person doing the work gets the money to do the work and that it takes a long time and that in for-profit it's super simple and you walk down Sand Hill Road and they hand you money as you go. Um, I don't think that's true. Um, and I think there is more money available, but I think when you're doing social purpose work, that money is, um, that industry is really underdeveloped and uh, hard to navigate, and there are big gaps, and a bank is not going to give you a loan. So I think, um, do, okay, so, the, but your question is, do I see it getting better? Um, I think um, there's more money flowing to the kind of funding we do, which is very idea-driven, which encourages innovation because you don't have to fit neatly into any bucket per se. And I think that's good. Like 25 entities gave us money to give away, which is um, really unusual. Warren Buffett gave Gates money to give away. I think these are really positive trends. Rather than everybody doing their own philanthropy, people are saying, oh, that I want to do it together. Um, but uh, I, philanthropy is also... Uh, and social impact investing is highly personal, and the investor does things for sometimes pretty quirky reasons. People invest in for-profits for quirky reasons. Like, people don't buy baseball teams because they make money, right? They do it because they personally want to own a team. Um, so there are uh, examples in the for-profit world as well. But I think in philanthropy it's even more true that it's super personal, and you have to deeply connect with the person with the money and figure out what do they care about and how can I um, show them that what I'm doing is important enough that they should care about it too. Ginny, how, how many of your um, companies or organizations you invested in yeah. have gone after the three years to become a for-profit, if any? Um, 
You mean converted. Um, we have a couple who are, um, it's interesting, um, Kamaza, which is a tree um, agriculture play in Kenya, is con- tr- thinking about or is in the middle of converting to a for-profit. Avanti Fellows is education in um, India, and they have two parts now, a for-profit and non-profit. Sanergy has two parts, a for-profit and a non-profit. Um, so more and more. And we're getting our donors more comfortable with both. Um, it's new for them, too. Yeah. Yeah. Good? Everyone's still awake? That's good. <laughs> all right, so let's all give.